Hey gang, let's talk solutes. In particular, we're going to be talking today about the difference between ionic compounds and covalent compounds. A simple definition that we've been using for an ionic compound is a compound that's composed of ions. And most of the time, that is composed of a metal cation and a negatively charged nonmetal anion. Salt's a good example for that. We know that salt is soluble in water. So if we take some salt and we shake it into water, we're not at all surprised when we see that salt seem to disappear. But in reality, all it's doing is becoming part of an aqueous solution now. On the same hand, we can look at a covalent compound. And remember, for us, covalent compounds are typically compounds made of nonmetals, and they're not composed of ions. In fact, those atoms are bonded together using covalent bonds. That's bonds where electrons are shared between two atoms. Sugar is a good example of that. It's made of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in about a one to two to one ratio. You'll notice that when I shake the sugar into water, it really looks exactly the same as what we saw when we looked at how salt dissolves in water. But there's actually more to the story, and that's where we need to get into some details. One key macroscopic difference that we can use, and especially as environmental chemists, we can measure this, is conductivity. Now, conductivity just measures if electricity can be passed through a given aqueous solution. And notice right now, this is just pure water. The light bulb is dim. The light bulb is not lit, which means electricity is not able to pass through it. Now, if I add some salt, you'll notice that the light bulb starts to glow brighter and brighter and brighter with the more salt that I add until my salt shaker is completely empty. This means that salt changes something about the properties of the water. In particular, that aqueous solution that contains an ionic compound that's dissolved will be electrically conductive. Let's see if the same thing's true for sugar. Notice how in this case, sugar does not affect the conductivity electrically of an aqueous solution that it's soluble in. So that's a key difference right there. Ionic compounds will cause a solution to be conductive and covalent compounds will not. To better understand these differences, let's take a more nanoscale approach. Now let's look at sodium chloride from a particle level perspective. If I shake out some salt and pause it before it actually interacts with the water, you'll notice something that probably won't surprise you. You'll notice that you see individual ions, in this case, magenta or sodium ions, green, or chloride ions, and those are all stuck together in a way that actually makes sense. The positive ions are close to the negative ions because oppositely charged particles are going to be attracted. That's what we would call that ionic bond that forms between those ions. But here's something that's interesting. Watch what happens when the salt hits the water. Notice that now those ions have been liberated from one another. So something had to disrupt the attractions they felt to one another, so much so that they are able to freely dissociate or break apart into their individual ions. Notice we have free sodium ions floating around, free chloride ions floating around. We'll get to what causes this in just a minute, but now let's take that same approach and look at sugar. Now remember sugar or sucrose is a covalent compound. So again, we're gonna shake it out of the sugar shaker. I'm gonna pause it before it hits. And what I want you to do is notice the way that it's represented here. Over here on the right, upper right, here's a sucrose molecule. Now molecule is a word that chemists will use exclusively with covalent compounds. We use the term formula units with ionic compounds. So notice we've got the sucrose molecules. You can see we probably got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, around 10 or so individual sucrose molecules. Now watch what happens when they hit the water and dissolve. Okay, so something very different than what happened with the ionic compound. Here we have dissolving, but what we do not have is dissociation. That's the difference between why an ionic compound conducts electricity and a covalent compound does not. Here, the particles that are free to move around carry no overall charge. That's not the case if we switch back to salt, because in that case, we have mobile ions. Each of these individual particles carries a charge, and that's what allows electrical current to be conducted through a solution that contains a dissolved ionic compound. 
The final piece of the puzzle to help us understand why these processes happen in both situations is to understand the role of water. Water is a solvent. Solvents are things that form intermolecular attractions with solutes and form solutions. Now, water we often call the universal solvent, but it doesn't dissolve everything. In fact, some things it dissolves quite poorly, things like oils, for example. But let's look at the example in a little finer detail where we actually can see water molecules. So here you notice there's a representation of a water bath on the extreme nanoscale where we see individual water molecules uh, bouncing around one another in a liquid state. Now I want you to think for a moment about what will happen when I, when I drop this crystal of two formula units of sodium chloride into this bath of water. Now you know that it's going to dissociate and dissolve, but I want you to think in particular about how the water molecules might orient themselves around each of the ions. Take a minute, watch what happens. Got to pause it because it happens rather quickly. Now, I'm going to repeat this in just a second so we can look at chlorine. But take a look at the sodium ions. If I turn on water's partial charges, you'll notice that each of those ions has a lot of water molecules where the negatively charged part of the water molecule, which is the oxygen part of the water molecule, is facing that ion. That multiplied by six, seven, or eight water molecules is the effect that allows water to dissolve sodium chloride. Because the attractions between water, an individual water molecule and an individual sodium ion are not strong compared to the attractions between a sodium ion and a chloride ion. But when you have a lot of water molecules attracting a singular sodium ion, that allows water to dissolve an ionic compound like sodium chloride. Just repeat this again and see if the same pattern is true with chlorine. And here we can see the chloride ion. And if I turn on water partial charges, you'll notice that these hydrogen ends on the water molecule tend to be facing towards the chloride ion. So just like we've talked about in the past, oppositely charged regions of molecules and oppositely charged particles attract one another. Again, this is this hydrolysis process that allows water to be able to dissolve ionic compounds. It's very much the same situation for sugar, with the exception of understanding that sugar molecules do not dissociate. They just are gonna break apart into individual molecules. Now here, the molecule of sugar has been colored yellow, but I want you to understand that the larger atoms are oxygen atoms and the smaller atoms are hydrogen atoms. So the reason why water can break apart sugar is for similar reasons behind how water can dissolve things like salt. It can form reasonably strong attractions between the water molecule and the sugar molecule, right? The key difference here is water molecules do not pull apart individual molecules of sugar.